being able to negotiate with your lender on an interest rate cap, what you can ask for, what you can't, whether you're being taken advantage of. Right. I mean, to be honest with you, there are so many institutions out there, you know, and I don't need, need mean to name any, but they have their own trading floors at these huge institutions. Right. So if you say, hey, guy, I know you have your loan with us, but if you need to get an interest rate cap, our trading floor will do it. Well, guess what? You're about to get scammed for about 25 to 75 basis points, possibly. At, at, at our shop at, at um, 30 Capital Financial, we go as far as willing to share the screen of our Bloomberg to show you that we're not taking advantage of on basis points. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Kevin Swill is a C-suite CRE professional with more than 25 years of CRE experience. He's an owner, a broker, an equity raiser, and a structuring and investor professional. Kevin, welcome to the show. Yeah, nice to see you, Sam. Hey, Great thank you to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. Certainly appreciate it. There's three questions, Kevin. I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell me where did you start? Where are you now? And how did you get there? Started out in investment banking immediately, starting as a pioneer in the uh, CMBS world for investment banking. Mm -hmm. Then went over to the uh, private equity side and was president of a development company. And then uh, went around the world and raised equity for many of my sponsor friends. And now I'm on the fintech side. Uh, that's that's, that's it. Not, that's that's thirty years all wrapped up. <laughs> <laughs> it's thirty years all wrapped up with a with a lot of moving parts. You know, there's the, yes there's, in, inside of that. What would you say are your major focuses today? Our make is, our, our our most important focus right now is helping our clients navigate through the recession, navigate through development projects that they have understanding how to change from LIBOR to SOFR. Uh, we've always, for 22 years, have done defeasance. Uh, we were the pioneer, the first ones to do it. Uh, we also do a lot of interest rate caps and swaps. And then we have a whole other side of our house, which with engineers, developers from around the world. And what they, they do is they create applications that will help uh, the commercial real estate ecosystem. So it can be a one-stop shop that we can do anything from live real-time cash flows to forward curve analysis on your real estate so that you can make a, 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 an intelligent decision as to whether or not to refi, sell, or hold your asset. That is amazing. I want to hear yes. more about that. You mentioned something there that you guys have always done and you pioneered the defeasance space. What does that mean? Well, you know, back back in the early, uh, I guess, early 90s, uh, when CMBS came around, uh, or, and even before CMBS, which is the commercial mortgage-backed securities, you know, let, borrowers were allowed to prepay their loans, you know, very similar to like a house. In a house, there isn't any prepayment penalty. Right. But in commercial real estate, you either have these 54321, meaning in the fifth year, you pay 5% of the outstanding balance, and it goes down. You also have yield maintenance. And then all of a sudden, jumping onto the scene in the year 2000 was this defeasance formula, which people and lenders really enjoyed and liked it. It was very complicated, but it seemed to be an alternative to yield maintenance. And uh, 30 Capital, which its predecessor name was Commercial Defeasance, was the first one out there. And uh, we pretty much covered the market for the first seven years. What, what what did you do in the market? What was the need in the market that you guys were, or the problem maybe in the market right. that you guys were solving? Yeah, it was it was definitely not a problem. What was happening was, you know, from as, as we all know, before the crash of two thousand and eight, mark valuations were just going through the roof, uh, very similar to what we've had the last three years. And as such, borrowers wanted to sell, and in order to sell, you know, you have to get out of your collateral and. Uh, with the CMBS, which is a very complex um, structure, which I, we don't have to get into today, but those end users, uh, the end buyers, they want their interest payments for the full 10 years. Right. So you know what? I just felt that my property just doubled in year seven, my valuation. I want to sell. Great. Go read your loan documents. Your loan documents say, yes, you can sell. You can either have them assume the loan or 
you can have pay a defeasance fee. We'll structure it. We'll you know substitute securities for your collateral, and you're gone. And um, you know a lot of borrowers understood it, and they did it because they were making so much money on the profit or the capital gains from that sale that it was worth it for them to pay the defeasance cost and move over. Now it's the way it worked. So what did you guys? What was your uh, what was your role in that? We were the advisors. Uh, you couldn't do a defeasance without having an advisor. And we were the only ones out there that understood that methodology. And we were the ones who perfected the system. So you would bring, so I would call you. I'd say, hey, Kevin, you know, I got this property. We bought it for 20 million. We're selling it for 40 million. I'm in year seven. I'm about to sell and I'm going to yep. get hammered on whatever this defeasance is. How do you help? Well, we walk them through the, the calculation. So we have on our website, for example, a defeasance calculator. Ah. Well, you'll, you'll put in certain aspects of the loan uh, and things of that sort, and then we'll come out with whatever that number is, which, are, which really is the cost of securities to substitute for those more monthly payments that you were making as the borrower. So we're that, we're that advisor to help you go into the marketplace and, uh, and unload your collateral. Got it. That's a that's a really yeah. complex. Uh, it's a complex series of steps that have to happen in order for you to get out of a property early. Right. Yes. And that's one of those things that some borrowers, especially mamas and papas, need to understand that when they're reading loan documents, you know, you don't think about when you're going to sell and you don't think about prepayment rights. But, you know, there's there's very, something very important that you need to read and understand. And part of our business, quite frankly, is we educate. We educate all the time. We have an academy uh, at uh, at 30 Capital Financial. So we're educating the entire uh, real estate ecosystem on different aspects of real estate, especially defeasance, especially for students that are just getting out of college and starting their, their careers. Yeah, that's that's really, really interesting. How does defeas well, let me break let me ask this question because this is a question I've probably had for too long and haven't answered. What's the difference between between defeasance and yield maintenance? It's it's all formulaic. Okay. It's all formulaic. To, to get into that, I, I could, but it becomes very complicated. And I'm not sure if your listeners really want to know the differences. Probably probably not. But, I guess so so for yeah. all intents and purposes, are they essentially the same? Just with different, the, they just function differently, or for the most part. But okay. uh, I think that you know a lot of people, once they understand the defeasance calculator, is very simple, um, and we'll explain to them. I mean, there are loan documents that say you have a choice of yield maintenance or defeasance, but I think since the year probably two thousand three, it's only been defeasance. They took only. away yield maintenance. Got it. Okay. Hey, see, I learn something new every day. And this is why I'm doing a podcast is because I get to ask you all the questions and, 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 and learn myself. So this is fun. Absolutely fun. I feel like I'm in class. I feel like I'm in class, you know, taking a, uh, an oral exam. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's not do that. That's no fun. Nah, I, hate I love to learn, course. but I hate school. So let's not do no. class. Uh, yes. t t tell me this, where we are on interest rates right now. I mean, one of the big yeah. conversations Obviously, there's fear of where interest rates are going. We're seeing kind of things cool off or at least the market shift slightly because of the interest rate changes. Yeah. What's happening? How are interest rate caps being affected? What's that whole market look like in the marketplace that's around? Well, um, I'll, I'll try to put it into a nutshell because we don't have the whole day here. But, you know, I think anyone that's in commercial real estate understands the volatility that has gone on this year right. based on inflation based on what's going on in the market. I mean, if I, you know, I live down here in the Southeast of the United States during COVID, I mean, a house wasn't on the market more than a day. Right. Um, and the same thing happened on commercial real estate. Uh, people were buying condos left and right before the construction even started. Um, my per particular home that I live in is now double in value just in the last two and a half years, which is absurd, unheard of, but, it's there. And very similar to what happened in 2006. It's not that different. But now you have the inflation factor. You have, you know, uh, a lot of issues with uh, with construction, with, you know, the chain chain blocks and what's going on there and getting your supplies. So that's created a problem. 
So you put all that together and people are nervous. So at the beginning of 2022, everyone was selling. 2021, everyone was selling. I think there was $78 billion uh, traded uh, in the year uh, 2021. Uh, And it's gone up in 2022 from that. So where we're stuck right now is interest rates are are rising. We know that. We understand that. For the older folks out there, we understand that the average rate should be six or seven or eight percent because that's what we lived with normally. It's unprecedented at two and three percent, and it's and it, and it can't last. So now we're at this crux where we have so many investors out there that either want to sell their assets or buy, you know, or buyers out there. And what we've seen is up until 2022, it was easy as can be. It was it, everything was above asking price. Now. What we're finding is people being unrealistic based on where cap rates are, based on what the the inflated value of an asset really is. So now you're finding a lot of these transactions are dying and people are getting stuck. The sellers either now have to make a decision. I can't sell it because there isn't a buyer at the price I want. So do I refinance it? And if I refinance it, do I do it short term just until we get through this crisis? And if we are doing it short term, do I get an interest? Do I do I do a floating or a bridge loan or do I get a short term fixed rate loan? And that's the dilemma that a lot of owners are in. And what we do at our company is we try to advise our clients which way is the best way for you to go and how to execute that. And I know there are a lot of intermediaries that do that and we're not an intermediary. But we want to make sure that our clients understand that if they're going to do a short-term fixed rate, you're counting on the market changing in that period of time, and it's going to be to your advantage, to be accretive to you. If you do a floating rate deal, you give yourself that flexibility because you don't have any exit penalties and things of that sort, of prepayment penalties. But what we've noticed is that in order to do floating rate, almost every lender out there today is requiring an interest rate cap. And the reason for that is they want to protect the institution, but also it's a a protection for the borrower. So there's an insurance policy in play. And like with normal people that have, you know, personal life insurance, you pay monthly to keep your, you know, your term or whatever it may be that you have. In real estate, the, the, the one challenge you have is on an interest rate cap, you're paying all of it up front. So if you're going to do a three-year bridge loan because you're building a new condo, right? They'll say, okay, fine. It's, you know, it's a $65 million project. It's for three years. We want you to get an interest rate cap. We want you to purchase it. Now, that's literally throwing away money in some in, in the way people look at it, but it's also an insurance policy. Right. Because at the end of the three years, you can be in the money. So you might want to start selling it and replacing it with something else. But what's most important is people are saying in the last three or four months, I should say, what the hell's happened? Because if I bought this interest rate cap seven or eight months ago, it might have been 20000 Now we're talking about 400000 And it's just money out the door. But I'd like to say to those people that you have to look at your investment. What is it that you're looking to do? You're looking to get through this issue of the, of the economy with the inflation and interest rates and then hopefully be able to build your condominium and then be able to sell those those you know those units at enough margin that you didn't have to worry about the interest rate cap and for some of these large institutions if you think about it if they're building four or five projects right now or they're refinancing four or five projects at $400,000 a clip that's a lot of equity that you need to throw out uh, but it's important. You have to have it if you want to work with some of the larger institutions. So there has been a new a new thing that came out, which is called springing interest rate caps. And we do a lot of that at our shop. And really what you're saying is, okay, I need it for three years. The lender is telling me I need a three-year cap. So what am I going to do? So you negotiate. We help you negotiate with the with the lender. And we say, look, Why don't we do this? Why don't we agree upon a strike price and let's just do a one-year interest rate cap? It's going to save me a hell of a lot of money in year one. The risk you take is, is that at the end of year one, you have to renew and you either renew for a two-year or a one-year. And that's the risk you're going to take 
where are it, you know where is it going to price out in a year from now? So you have two schools of thought. Do you just buy the three year, bite it, say goodbye, and and just deal with it and move on and hope that you know you build a successful uh, project and you make a lot of money, or you just put a little bit of the money in now and take a gamble on what's going to happen in the future. So those are the things that we help you figure out and help you through that process. Because for a lot of borrowers, it is a complicated and something that they really don't want to spend too much time thinking about. Because at the end of the day, they can just say, you know what, we're going to put the whole project on hold, or we're not going to do any value add at the property for another year. We're going to keep it as is and keep raising rents. But eventually you get to the rent point, a threshold where people are saying, I can't even afford to rent anymore. Right. And that we're seeing a lot of now. Right. That's uh. That's yeah. That's that's really. Th- th- thank you for taking the time to yeah. kind of break down some of the and, and it's some of the the the, uh, the intricacies of that. I mean, it's got to be on a project by project or a borrower by borrower basis that these are these options are analyzed and you know then integrated into the projects. That's uh. That's really yeah crazy. You guys are also running a interest rate marker interest rate cap marketplace. Is that right? That is correct. That is correct. So, so we are forefront of being able to to help with the clients with that. We have an entire trading floor that works specifically with clients, advise clients, advise brokers, and advise even lenders on you know what it is that they need to do to execute a transaction with interest rate caps. Um, you know, that's part of it. And our trading floor also does a lot of education on what's going to happen in July of 2023, which is the conversion, the, the last day of even hearing about the word LIBOR. So it, right now, if you have a LIBOR loan that you got two years ago and you have two more years left and you're not thinking about today how to convert it to SOFA or actually do it at SOFA before the rates go even higher, you know, you're doing a disservice for yourself. And we like to make sure that our clients uh, are are informed and make the right decisions. There, I, there's a couple of questions here. I want to want to come back to the LIBOR to so sure. discussion, but on the trading floor, it yeah. sounds like interest rate caps. And my understanding, again, I have no experience in this personally, so I'm asking this sure. in a complete position of ignorance. Can interest rate caps be bought and sold? Yes. And is that what's happening on your trading floor? Uh-oh. Uh, it's not happening on our trading floor. You know, we're not in the business of, of really trading. That's, that's for someone else and some other organization to do. We're just really helping them through the process of securing an interest rate cap, being able to negotiate with your lender on an interest rate cap, what you can ask for, what you can't, whether you're being taken advantage of. Right. I mean, to be honest with you, there are so many institutions out there, you know, and I don't need, need, mean to name any, but they have their own trading floors at these huge institutions. Right. So if you say, hey, guy, I know you have your loan with us, but if you need to get an interest rate cap, our trading floor will do it. Well, guess what? You're about to get scammed for about 25 to 75 basis points, possibly. At, 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 at our shop at, at um, 30 Capital Financial, we go as far as willing to share the screen of our Bloomberg to show you that we're not taking advantage of on basis points. We have a flat fee that we charge and then the rest is just all formulaic and we don't make any basis points on that. We're not taking advantage of our clients. We're trying to help our clients. Whereas in a large institution, it's literally two separate business units. Right. So they're looking out for themselves. For sure. For sure. Got it. That's uh that's that 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 gives some 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 definite uh color to that you know that that question. Thank you for that. Yes. LIBOR mm-hmm. to so for. So yeah. tell me how that could uh, negatively impact a borrower if they're not paying attention today. Well, you know, it's interesting because today they it just coincidentally they happen to be right about at the same level. So now's a good time to transition where the rates are for so for and the, let's say the 30 day LIBOR and where that is, it's fairly close, but you don't know what's going to happen between now and July of 2023, where your LIBOR rate, you know, might be at one level, but by then SOFR might be a lot higher. And now when you go to make that change, you're paying a lot more in interest. 
a lot more. So what we try to tell our clients is watch the LIBOR, watch the SOFA. And interestingly enough, when we do when we do these um, interest rate calculations for, for caps and stuff, or if we're trying to do a transition of SOFA and LIBOR, our calculators on our website actually tell you that if you do it in LIBOR, or if you would have if you have a LIBOR, this is what the rate is. But if you had SOFR, this is what the rate would be. So you can make an intelligent decision. And we post every week where SOFR is, where LIBOR was, and so forth. And then you can plug in your deal. What are the loan types that are subject to this that it would make a difference? I'm thinking on a 30-year, again, I'm just throwing out, you know. Well, the, the, it, it, well typically, it's all on floating rate loans. Got SOFR it. and LIBOR are only based on SOFR. You know, so so that's really a construction loan, a value add loan, you know, a small bridge loan, yeah, things of that sort. That, yeah. 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 Okay. That answers the question is if you have floating rate debt and you're not paying attention to it. So what are what are the action steps that someone takes then? Okay. Hey, you know, Kevin, I was on your way on your site. I did the calculation and I see that that I should be converting this now. I guess I'm, if, if, if I'm right. even, even using the so right we, terms. So we, no, that's fine. And, and 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 quite frankly, what it is, is it's whether or not the, the borrower is knowledgeable. Some borrowers don't even know what their finance department put in place. Right. But we tell everybody to go through your through your portfolio, see which ones are floating. And if they're floating, what are they based on? If it was in the year of 2022, we already know it has to be in SOFR. Mm. If it was prior to that, it could still have been a LIBOR deal and you're still on the LIBOR. So we tell you, look at that closely. And if you need assistance understanding it, we can help you. But it's time for you to go speak to your borrower, I mean, your lender, i.e. your servicer, and saying, hey, look, we have a LIBOR legacy loan. We think that it's time for us to convert it to SOFR. And that's it. We don't do that. That is between the borrower and the and the lender or servicer. But we'll give you the tools and the ammunition to help you with that transition. I love it. I love it. Kevin, thank you for taking the time to break down some of the some of the more uh, nuanced portions of that. Certainly appreciate it. One last question for you here. You guys are building a prop tech called Lobby. I think you called it Lobby CRE. Can you that is give me correct. a 30 second overview of what that is and where our listeners maybe can start looking out for that when it goes live? Yes, it is live now. And in the few months that we're live, we have over 10,000 units. And really what it is, in a nutshell, is very simple. And I like to do it from 30,000 feet. You're a CEO or a COO. You wake up in the morning and you want to know because you have 100 properties. uh, And you want to know, hey, what's my occupancy since yesterday or since last week on my whole portfolio? In real time, we will tell you to the decimal what your occupancy is. We will then, you can then touch that little circle on your screen and it'll break it down either by region, by state, or by property manager or regional manager. So you'll know where the problem is. And then you can get all the way down to every single line item in your financial statement that you want to compare to your other properties or to your um, uh, comp uh, properties, whatever that may be, you can see. So, So from that standpoint, you can see that in a second. Also, you have 100 properties. You want to do a financial statement. Usually, you go to your regional property managers or your regionals and you have, give me your cash flows. And then someone in your main office puts it together. Five seconds, we can give you your whole portfolio. We can give you your portfolio cash flows by you know one property. That's only one aspect. Mm-hmm. Now, we're including debt management. So you can analyze your own debt on your portfolio or on your assets. All done for you. All automated. Same with equity. How is your equity? How are the waterfalls coming? We can do all of that. And the biggest thing that we just started, now that we talk about ESG in the world, is we have really legal entities. So you can actually put all of your loan documents into the portal. We will remind you every year, your registered agent, because every state it's different, your registered agent is due. Would you like us to go do it for you? All automated. Everything is automated. You want to go sell your property, you tell your lawyer. Hey, it's not going to take you hours that you're charging me a thousand dollars an hour. Go into the portal. Here is the property. Every document you would ever need, including financials, tax return, anything. It's all in the portal, and that can be done. So this lobby CRE is a way to have 
any borrower or any company's ecosystem all wrapped up into one and to be live. You're okay. getting real time data. That is fantastic. Kevin, As thank you, you so see, much. I'm a big cheerleader. I'm a cheerleader of our business. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo- I love it. I absolutely love it. That's really cool. Look forward to checking, yeah. certainly checking that out. Kevin, if our listeners want to get in touch with you, learn more about you, your defeasance uh, services, your lobby CRE, any of those, what is the best way to do that? You can come, you can come visit us at 30capitalfinancial.com or you can go right on to lobbycre.com. Any one of those will take you to whatever you need to see. If you go to 30capitalfinancial.com, that's where our defeasance, that's where our SOFR, that is where all of our financial stuff is. Lobby CRE allows you through technology to gas, grasp all of your stuff. And the last thing is we have an academy that we set up last year, which is accredited and it's really serving the entire industry for young people that want to learn about real estate that don't have the experience, but want to get a job and they get their job and they say, boss, you don't have to train me. I can go to this class one hour a week for eight weeks and I'll be as good as a two year underwriter for you. That's all for that. That is very cool. Kevin, thank you so much. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you for coming on today. All right. Thank you, Sam.